What if I were to tell you that there's a scientifically proven method to make your art creepy? Imagine. You arrive home late one day and you find yourself alone in your empty home. It's dark outside. All traces of the sun's warmth have been replaced with harsh, artificial lighting. You're hungry. You sit down and have some dinner. Alone. You're tired and want to call it a night. So you get up from the comfort of your favorite chair and decide to take a shower. But it's far to the shower and you're alone. But are you? You get into the shower and all you can hear is the sound of rushing water. You start to think. Us humans have a blind spot. Can we ever truly know what's lurking behind us? When we're all alone? If we're alone? Time comes to wash your hair. And, just for a few seconds, you have to close your eyes. And in those seconds, when your eyes are closed, you know true terror. Defying all logic, you know that there's something there, watching you. While not everyone experiences this, it is a fairly common human experience. But why? The rational parts of our brain know that there's nothing there. The theory is that the rational side of our brain clashes with a more primal instinct. The situation is ambiguous. This is why certain people, myself included, are afraid of or distrust clowns. Can we know what's behind the mask? To a small extent, even a smile that doesn't touch the eyes can be creepy, because we know that something is off. Things such as a loaded gun or swimming in a sea of sharks can cause fear. But this is different from creepiness. In these cases, the source of danger is obvious and your fear makes sense. Creepiness is defined as causing an unpleasant feeling of fear or unease. I like to think of creepiness as this primal knowledge that something is not quite right and the source of danger has suddenly become ambiguous. Other theories suggest that humans don't like to be reminded of death or predators, which is why we don't like traits such as life with skin or long fingernails. We prefer things which we can relate to. And we relate primarily to two different things. The first is other humans. We speak to humans, spend time with them, and we connect to them. When we have discussions, we interact, share our thoughts and feelings, and we communicate through subconscious cues, such as body language. The other category is things that are cute or display human emotions or traits, but are either unrealistic or distinctly not human. These are two very distinct categories, and our brain likes to classify everything into one of the two. But sometimes, we encounter things that are slightly off. They're trying to be human, and yet aren't. The line between the two categories is blurred, and our brain doesn't know what to do with them. Because between these two categories, we have what's known as the uncanny valley. The concept of the uncanny valley was first introduced in 1970 by a Japanese robotics professor, Masashiro Mori. It was published in a Japanese journal called Energy, but was largely ignored at the time of publication. However, in 2012, this article was translated and published in the journal IEEE Robotics and Automation magazine. With this article, Mori hypothesized that a person's response to a human-like robot would abruptly shift from empathy to revulsion as it approached, but failed to attain a lifelike appearance. This descent into eeriness is known as the uncanny valley. The article explains that we have no affinity for non-humanoid industrial robots, but we have nothing against them either. Then, we get robots with humanoid traits such as Wally and Eve, and people generally love them. But then, as we start to approach the humanoid robots, there's a sudden revulsion. We see their lifeless skin, their facial expressions that don't quite sit right. Our brain recognizes that there's something wrong. There's no life or soul to this thing, and it introduces this ambiguity. It feels like it's trying to trick us. One well-known example of this is Tara the android. There are many other examples of these robots in the uncanny valley. These are examples of robots trying to be human, and therefore trying to avoid the uncanny valley. But we can take advantage of this uncanny valley effect in order to make things creepy. In fact, many horror movies do this when creating their villains. So, what does this mean for our art? We just need to shift our art into this uncanny valley. That means, if we're doing realism, 
we need to add stylized elements to our art while maintaining the same levels of realism. Keep in mind, sharp teeth, corpse-like or diseased skin and other things like it help as well. If we do more stylized art, we can add elements of realism to it to draw it into this uncanny valley. A good example of this is from the kids show Courage the Cowardly Dog. As a little kid in the early 2000s, this show terrified me. The episode, King Ramsey's Curse, is widely accepted as being one of the most creepy. In this episode, they changed their style from the traditional cartoon to a badly rendered CGI for King Ramsey's. This was a deliberate choice and it made it all the more terrifying. As an adult, this may not seem that creepy, but watching this alone late at night as a child, it was terrifying. Was anyone else traumatized by a kid's show they used to watch, or is it just me? Let me know in the comments. So this is a drawing I did a few weeks ago of a beautiful girl I found on Pinterest. So let's apply what we've learned from the uncanny valley to make this more creepy. The purpose of this demonstration isn't to create a horrifying monster, but just to illustrate how powerful a few uncanny adjustments can be. I would like to take a moment to sincerely thank everyone who has subscribed to my channel, or like one of my videos, or watch my videos right to the end. You guys really do help me out so much, and I appreciate every single one of you. I really do get so excited every time I see one of those numbers go up. I love you all so much.